All right, hello class. Um, in this video, we are actually leaving um, the applications of integration and integration techniques, and we're going to start focusing on um, sequences and series. And mainly, we're going to be focusing on series. Um, and where this comes from, it's kind of a backwards sort of a backwards way to go about it, I, I, some may argue. Um, but at, at the same time, um, this is one of those deeper concepts that, you know, you wouldn't throw at the average Cal 1 student. But by the time you're ha about halfway through Cal 2, uh, it does make some sense to actually start looking at this and focusing on it. Okay, so here is the... Um, Here's the motivation. All right, the motivation is that um, we have mentioned quite a few times in this class and probably in your Calculus 1 class as well that the integral of f of x dx from a to b, so the definite integral, actually ends up being a infinite sum of numbers, right? It ended up being this sum, where we let k go from 1 to some capital N, right, of your f of x sub k's, then time your delta, times your delta x's, and when we, um, when we took the limit of this as the capital N goes to infinity, um, we would say we get equals, okay, but the um, integral is only approximately equal to um, the partial sum. So if you just do like k going from 1 to n, right, you do the finite sum, right, you just get the approximate, but if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, which as you do that, so that's the number of rectangles, if you remember, um, as we do that, your delta x is going to zero. So it, it turns out that not only does this infinite sum of numbers actually sum up to be something, it comes out to be the definite integral. Okay, so what this whole section in this module and this whole particular module is all about is taking a closer look at this entity here, this infinite sum. And that is what a series is. A series is an infinite sum of things. Okay, so let's um, define it a little more carefully. I'm not going to give the official like mathematician definition because, you know, that can be saved for a later date. Um, but that's the, the motivation. We want to study this thing here, this infinite sum. Okay, so a series is an infinite sum of numbers, and we usually define it like this. Um, we have the capital sigma, that means the sum. Okay, so let me write some of this down. This means the, the sum of a k from k equals 1 to infinity. Don't really know why I wrote it out that time, but um, essentially what this does, okay, is it takes your AKs and where that what the AKs are, um, the you know this is where say AK is an infinite list. So it's an infinite ordered list. So really, um, we're talking like a list like, oh, it's A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and on and on and on. It goes up to A sub N, then A sub N plus 1, and then just keeps going from there and never ends. So what the series does is 
adds all these up. It starts at 1, and it doesn't have to start at 1. Um, this just happens to start at 1. It can start at whatever number you want, however you decide to index them. That's not what is important. We don't really study... Um, or what we really study is what happens as we go further out, not necessarily what happens right at the beginning. But this will take this list of numbers and just add them all up. So it will be uh, A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4 plus A5 plus, and then it just keeps going. And then, you know, you might have your AN plus AN plus 1 and then on and on and on and on. Okay, so that's essentially what it is. It just sums up a bunch of items and a whole bunch, an infinite number of them. Okay, um, this infinite ordered list, that's what a sequence is. So this infinite ordered list Okay. is the sequence. Okay, so it's a sequence. Now, the official um, math definition that they'll give you uh, for a sequence, it's really just a function whose domain is, um, you know, uh, the natural numbers or just counting numbers. Um, to me, I just think of it as an infinite list. I understand why they use that uh, definition, but um, anyway, an infinite ordered list is a sequence and a series sums up every item in a sequence. So the two are fairly closely related. Um, a, a series just sums up a sequence. A sequence is each item in the series. There is a difference. The sequence is the list, while the series is the sum of the items on the list. Okay, and I find students um, do kind of mix this up from time to time, um, but be very careful and deliberate about which one we're, you're talking about. I will try to do so myself, um, but just remember the sequence is the list, and you can think of that as um, how we would use the word sequence um, normally, a sequence of events, right, a a sequence of characters on a screen. You aren't necessarily doing anything with that sequence. You're just listing them out. Order also matters. A sequence of events, we tend to think of it's uh, in order. However, the series is actually doing something, right? It is adding everything up on this list, okay? So that is the introduction to what a series is. Um, there's a lot of uh, foundation we need to work on in order to actually start analyzing this. Um, you might think that this is meaningless. However, we will see many examples where this actually comes out to equal something. And it has a lot to do um, with, if you remember earlier in... Um, the semester we looked at improper integrals. Okay, so if we had a, a function that, you know, dropped down to zero fast enough, say this is one, we could actually calculate the integral from one to infinity. Okay, and this we would say converged if the limit existed, right? So the um, 
this would converge if the limit as capital N goes to infinity if this limit from 1 to capital N of f of x dx approached a number, right? Actually converged or converges to a number. Well, in the same way, the series is basically just taking these steps, one, two, three, four, five, and instead looking at the area of the rectangles. And if that, if those converge, right, if the areas get small enough to eventually converge, that's basically saying that the uh, series converges. Okay, now we'll get into more details about this at a later date, but I did want, you know, to spend some uh, time to let you know that this is something that's meaningful, right? These can actually converge to a number, and it's what it basically means is that these guys get so close to zero that eventually you're adding up a bunch of zeros. And as long as they get to zero fast enough, just like with the improper integrals, if they get to zero fast enough, then you're basically summing up a bunch of zeros and you can cut it off and you'll basically have, say, five or ten or whatever it ends up being. Okay? Now, the thing we really want to focus on in this particular section, though, is this foundation before we can start studying. Okay, so a lot of the time when we try and analyze a series, we have to look at properties of the sequence that will tell us whether or not the series converges. That's not always the case, but it often is. And because of that, we need to have a section, a lecture, where we um, talk about how we uh, deal with these sequences, and it's basically what the limits of the sequence are. Okay, So, let's write some of this stuff down. Okay, so as I was saying, often when analyzing a series, we actually look at whether a related sequence converges. Okay, so when does a sequence converge? Well, it turns out it's not as complicated as you might think. Um, basically, the short answer whenever a normal infinite limit would converge. Okay, and you might wonder what I mean by that statement. What I mean is that, um, consider this sequence here. Suppose a n is the sequence, um, let's say n squared plus 1 all over 2n squared plus 3. Okay. This sequence converges if the limit as n goes to infinity of a n converges, gets closer, actually exists. So if this limit exists, okay, and is a finite number. Well, you probably remember from Calculus 1 that um, the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared plus 1 all over 2 n squared plus 3 actually goes to one half. Now how do we know that? Well, um, there are a, quite a few ways we could do it. Um, we could do L'Hopital's rule. And I am, you know, 
I'm kind of butchering our notation here, but yeah, we could use L'Hopital's rule. Just assume that these are functions of x, for example. So actually, let me um, go ahead and do that. Let's say that instead we look at this limit, the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared um, over 2 x squared, and using L'Hopital's rule, that would be the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x over 4x, and the x's here will cancel, and we'll get 2 fourths, which is 1 half. Okay. The other way is just if the powers match, it comes out to be uh, comes out to be the fraction of the leading coefficients. Okay, that's another way. You might just know that it's leading coefficients. You don't even have to do um, L'Hopital's rule. So it, it actually turns out that um, the sequence a n will converge if the limit as x n going to inf or x going to infinity of f of x converges where f of n is equal to a n okay if they have the same formula so this uh, essentially means that every limit rule we have already still works. Okay, that's amazing because that means um, if my sequence, let's say a n, is something like uh, n times the natural log of n all over n squared, well, if I want to see if this converges, I can just take the limit like I normally would and even use L'Hopital's rule. So I'm not going to keep switching them back and forth between x and n. I'm just going to pretend that I have a continuous function, or maybe not so much continuous, but where we're looking. Um, continuous enough, right? Because <laughs> um, again, we definitely couldn't put zero in here, but everything positive should be fine. This will be continuous. Um, and I will just take the limit as n goes to infinity. So it'd be n times the natural log of n all over n squared. And um, I get in the habit of using arrows. I know some pe people will hate me for that, um, but I think using an arrow um, still, you know, does just fine. But remember, it, it has to be infinity over infinity or zero over zero in order to use the L'Hopital's rule. And so that's just what I'll do here. Um, the derivative of the bottom is the easier part. That's just 2n. The top part will have to use the product rule. Right, derivative of the first, which is just 1. So it'll be ln of n plus n times the derivative of the second part, which is 1 over n. So, or not yet. This will be, this will approach the natural log of n plus 1 over 2n. And once again, this will be as n goes to infinity. So that's why people want you to continue to write this. But with sequences, we're always letting n go to infinity. So with sequences, I'll just put, I'll start just doing SEQ for sequences. For sequences, we're always looking at n going to infinity. In fact, a lot of times, a lot of books, they'll just say the limit of a n instead of saying as n goes to infinity, because that is just what we're always looking at um, when it comes to these limits. Anyway, um, so this is still an infinity over infinity case, so we can use L'Hopital's rule again, and it should simplify into something we can actually manage. The derivative of the natural log of n with respect to n is 1 over n, 
and the derivative of 2n is 2. So that's 2 over 1 when we, let me continue to use arrows here, we invert and multiply, we'll get 1 over 2n, and that we can just now just take the limit, right? Because um, a 1 over infinity, constant over infinity, that will go to 0. Okay, so all those old rules, all those old limit rules that you've probably forgotten from Calculus 1 by this point, um, you probably need to go back and review them because uh, we're going to be using them a lot here. Okay. Okay, so here in, you know, big letters, just to really make the point, remember all previous limit techniques involving x going to infinity, they will apply to sequences with in going to infinity. Okay, the the same techniques, you can use them all. Lobatol's rule is a little sketchy, right? Some people would argue that that's not the way you're supposed to do it, but honestly, if you have a formula um, and that formula is nice and continuous and differentiable, just pretend you have a function of n and for a minute pretend like it's not a discrete um, list, right, that you're stepping through. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is a couple of examples of techniques you may not remember or you may not have even been taught. I think everyone's taught L'Hopital's rule. I think everyone's taught your basic limit properties. But there are a few that can fall through the cracks that you uh, may have missed out on. So I want to focus on those because they're going to be pretty important as we go forward. Um, they tend to be things that you could, you know leave out of Calculus 1 and not um, lose much sleep over it. Um, but we are going to use them quite a bit in this particular class. Okay, so let's just start getting to some of the examples. Okay, so this one is a famous example. Um, <clears throat> It's the sequence uh, 1 plus 1 over n all raised to the n. So I know uh, most people are very familiar with the following indeterminate forms. Um, and that's the 0 over 0 and the infinity over infinity. Those are the things that inspire L'Hopital's rule. Right? They're the things you have to have to use L'Hopital's rule. Um, however, this is also an indeterminate form because as n goes to infinity, 1 plus 1 over n goes to 1, and of course n goes to infinity. So this is a 1 over infinity case. Now you might be thinking, well, how is that, how is 1 to the infinity an indeterminate form? Well, it turns out it has everything to do with how fast the base goes to 1. Because if the base goes to 1 f really fast, then this thing will converge. Because what you essentially just get um, 1 to a bunch of really high powers, which is just 1s over and over and over again. right? However, if it doesn't go to one fast enough, eventually the to the n power will take over and you'll have numbers that aren't quite one but are close being raised to really high numbers that go there faster, okay, and it could diverge, right? So, so for like a b to the n, if b goes to one fast enough, the sequence will converge. If not, it will diverge. Okay, so how do we deal with a one to the infinity case or it really any case with a variable in your exponent? Well, the variable in the exponent case
uh, exponent. <laughs> uh, in the exponent case, you use log. That should be kind of familiar, right? Um, or we'll likely use ln instead of log. But uh, that should be familiar because that's how you solve equations with a variable in the exponent. So if I have that a n is equal to 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n, and I take the natural log of both sides, then I can actually take this n outside. That was kind of sloppy. Let me try that again. You can take it outside, right, as... Let me write it in the next line, actually. We can say that the natural log of a n is equal to n times the natural log of 1 plus 1 over n. Okay? Now, if I rewrite this... Well, um, so this is also now an indeterminate form because as n goes to infinity, what's in here goes to 1. So this piece is going to 0 on the top while this piece is going to infinity. So an infinity times 0 is another indeterminate form. And I'll just call it an IF, an indeterminate form. And how we usually deal with it Okay, is we move we move this piece down, and when we do that, we've got to be careful. We'll leave the natural log in the top, and then we'll have 1 over n in the bottom. Okay, because if you think about it, this is times n over 1. We can turn this into division by a fraction because 1 over n, right? And when you flip that back over, it's n times the natural log. Anyway, if you've seen this method before, um, feel free to sort of skip ahead. For those of you who haven't, um, this is how we treat this. And now, the top goes to 0, the bottom goes to 0. 0 over 0, we can use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so using L'Hopital's rule, the natural log of this stuff, all right, well, it will be the derivative of the stuff over itself. So the derivative of the stuff, well, the derivative of uh, 1 will be 0, of 1 over n will be negative 1 over n squared, all over just the stuff again, all over. Okay, now the derivative of this piece, which is negative 1 over n squared. Okay, so now the I'm going to um, simplify this a bit because we have like one big fraction. So we have a fraction within a fraction within a fraction. I'm going to invert and multiply this and, and see what we can do about it. Okay, so uh, first of all, the negatives will cancel. So I have 1 over n squared, okay, all over 1 plus 1 over n times n squared over 1. Well, when I multiply 1 over n squared by the n squared on the top, they cancel. Okay, so some of you probably saw this here, that these two things cancel. We could have done that there. Uh, you just got to be careful because there's still a 1 sitting here and a 1 sitting here. Um, it may not be obvious that this comes out to be 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. Okay, and now as n goes to infinity, this little piece here goes to 0, so the whole thing goes to 1. Now here's the trick. We didn't find that our original sequence went to 1, right? It's not that a n goes to 1, it's that the natural log of a n goes to 1. To get back to a n, we now use e. So we introduce an e, this is e to this stuff, e to that stuff, and thankfully limits carry over nice continuous functions. So this gives us that, well, e to the natural log of stuff cancels, so a n goes to e 
to the one, which is E. Okay, so there we go. And this is actually a really famous identity here, that 1 plus 1 over n to the n goes to E. Okay, so um, that's how we deal with the um, sort of variables in the exponent and the base. So let's look at another one. Uh, I should say before um, we go forward, this pattern shows up a lot, this E guy. Um, you may want to just, if not memorize it, just have it in your head um, because we will see it a lot or patterns like it. Um, and it, it turns out if you do this uh, same work, um, you can actually get a more general formula for like e to the x. For example, if you, um, and it might be a good, um, let me just put an X in here. It might actually be a good um, way to practice. If you put a number here above the N, that will go to E to that number. Okay, so if you put like a 10, 1 plus 10 over N, it would be E to the 10. Um, it might be a good practice to see if you can actually get that by using the same method we just did. Okay, and also you can obviously raise both sides to the x. To get uh, e to the x again, and this would come out to be uh, 1 plus 1 over n to the x times n is equal to e to the x. Okay, and then you can combine both. Um, if you did 1 plus y over n to the xn, then you would get both e to the xy. Okay, so again, this is not something that I expect you to maybe have memorized, but um, do recognize this pattern because um, when it pops up, you can save a lot of time if you know that this thing goes to e, for example, or, um, you know, this thing here goes to e to the x. All right, so in this uh, particular example, uh, I just wanted to show sometimes they'll write sequences like this. They won't say it's a and equals. They'll just write it, put it in braces, and call it a day. Okay, so don't freak out if that happens. Um, this is also an indeterminate form. Because as n goes to infinity, okay, of course, 1 over n goes to 0, and 3 over n goes to 0. So we have a 0 to the 0 case. Uh, 0 to the 0 case is indeterminate because um, remember what something to the 0 power means. Um, 5 to the 0 is 1 right? But then 0 to the 5 is 0, okay? Also, something to the 0 power, the reason it's 1 is because, imagine this, say you had 5 to the, say 5 squared over 5 squared, okay? 5 squared over 5 squared, that is, you could rewrite that, since it's the same base, as 5 to the 2 minus 2 which is 5 to the 0. But this is also the same thing over itself, so it's 1. So 0 to the 0 is essentially saying it's 0 to some power divided by 0 to some other power. Okay, well, there we go. Um, we're dividing by 0. So this is essentially a 0 over 0 case in disguise. Okay, but, however, depending on how these go to zero, right, if the base goes to zero fast enough, you might actually get zero out. However, if the uh, exponent goes to zero fast enough, 
Um, you might get one out or you might get something else out. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Um, I'm going to call this a n, so I have something to work with. So that's 1 over n to the 3n, and we do our log thing again. So it would be um, natural log of a n is equal to the natural log of 1 over n to the 3n, and like before we bring that, th um, I don't know why I did 3 halves there. Like before we take the uh, 3 over n outside. Okay, so we have the natural log of a n is equal to 3 over n times the natural log of 1 over n. All right, and um, this ends up being, well, this goes to 0, and this goes to negative infinity. So this is a 0 times infinity. Now, whenever you get those, you want to rewrite them. Okay, so to rewrite this one, um, it's almost given to us already. We could just say it's 3 natural log 1 over n all over n. Okay, so now the top, as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0, and natural log of 0 is undefined, but it goes to negative infinity, while n goes to infinity. So this is now an infinity over infinity case, so we can use L'Hopital's rule. All right, so um, we'll just take the derivative of the top and the bottom. So this will be 3 times. Now the derivative, let me clean this up a little bit. The derivative of natural log of stuff is the derivative of the stuff over itself. So the derivative of 1 over n is negative 1 over n squared. You might want to get used to some of these because we'll see them quite a lot. All right, so there's a derivative of the top. A neg negative 1 over n squared all over 1 over n. Then, thankfully, divided by 1. Okay, and so we can actually just ignore all this. Dividing by 1 doesn't do anything. So now we'll just invert and multiply here. So I'll keep the 3. Um, unfortunately, we can't get rid of the negative, so I'll just bring it out front. And I'll have 1 over n squared times n over 1. All right, so we get some cancellations. And I'm going to continue this down here. That's now negative 3 times 1 over n, and that will go to 0. Okay, so what we found is that the natural log of a n here goes to 0, but we want to find where a n goes to, so we just introduce our e. So that tells me that a n converges to e to the 0, which is 1. And there we go. Okay, so for this particular example, you want to find the limit of the sequence or state that it diverges. So that's always uh, encouraging, right, when it gives you a choice like that. So in this particular example, we have negative 1 to the n times n all over 2n plus 3. All right, so what happens with that negative 1 to the n? That is what I call like an oscillator um, or an alternator. This is an alternating sequence. Because um, what happens is as we list out the values, so for n equals 1, we get a negative. So it would be negative 1 over 2 plus 3, so 5. And then the next term, um, for n equals 2, so here's n equals 1, n equals 2, that becomes negative 1 squared, so that becomes positive. So we get 2 over 4 plus 3, which is 7. And then the next term, well, now we're back to an odd. Right, so that becomes a negative again. So it'll be negative 3 over 
9. So that would simplify down, but I'm not going to bother with that just yet. And then back in at 4. Okay. Um, at 4, this becomes positive again. So we'll have 4 okay, over 11. And then it will just keep going like that. Plus, minus, plus, minus, or really, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Now, we need to be um, mindful of the fact that, remember, a limit exists if and only if and in this case, we're only talking about um, infinite ones, but as n goes to infinity, the a n's get closer and closer to a single number. Okay, so i.e., as n goes to infinity, a n goes to L. Okay? Now, we used to check this in Calculus 1 for finite limits where we would check both sides, right, the right side and the left side, and they had to match. Okay? Well, um, notice for R uh, for this sequence, so I'll just call it a n equals negative 1 to the n times n all over 2 n plus 3. The non-alternating part okay, which is just n over 2 n plus 3 that goes to one half. Okay, that's fine. So, here's what we check. Instead of checking the left and the right side, um, because we can't, right, because there's only one side, we can check what makes these alternate, and that's even and odd. So we can check the even and odd terms. Okay, so the even terms Well, the even terms are all positive because a positive, right, now I'll say it's E for even times E all over 2E plus 3, right? I'm just using, maybe I shouldn't use E because we have a, an E that we always use, so I'll use capital E. I'm just showing that I'm only putting in even numbers. If I only put in even numbers, this thing basically equals 1 all the time. So we get a positive capital E over 2E plus 3, which as E goes to infinity, this goes to 1 half. All right, that's fine. And then we'll look at the odd terms. And O is going to be even harder to put in. So um, I'll just call it J. Okay, so for the odd terms, well now, this always, since it's negative 1 to an odd power, this will always be negative. So I'll get negative E all over, not E, I was just copying what I saw up there. It'll be negative J over 2J plus 3. So it actually goes to negative 1 half. So all the even terms go to 1 half all the odd terms go to negative one half. That means as time goes on, right, if I were to graph these terms, 
So let's say here's um, one half and then here's negative one half, probably not drawn to scale. But as these um, terms go along, what's happening is, you know, at first they're sort of oscillating back and forth and then eventually the even terms get closer and closer to this value while the odd terms get closer and closer to this value. So there is not a number that they ever get, you know, level out to. Okay, so this sequence diverges. Now, if the terms here would go to zero, that would be okay. Right, so alternating sequences that go to zero will be okay, will actually converge. Because if we, if we did the same thing here, if the non-oscillating part went to zero, then we'd get a zero and a negative zero, but that's still zero, right? That's not going to be a problem. So that's really what you have to worry about here. Okay, so um, to give you an example of that, of an alternating sequence that actually converges, consider something like sine of n over n. Now, we can't split this one up in as nice a way as we did in the last one because it's not the even and odd that makes this alternate. It will just act um, the way sine acts since it's playing with radians and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's going to oscillate, but not in a nice pattern um, that we could maybe predict and like check individually. However, sine and cosine, so sine of x is bounded. Right, we know that sine for any value that we put in is trapped between negative 1 and 1 which means that sine of n over n, if I just divide all these by n, we get that sine of n over n is trapped between negative 1 over n and positive 1 over n. And as n goes to infinity, plus or minus 1 over n goes to 0. So, this tells us that by the squeeze theorem, right, it's basically that this goes to zero, this goes to zero. So, by the squeeze theorem, which is another one that you may have seen or may have forgotten since it might not come up that often, by the squeeze theorem, sine n over n goes to zero because it's trapped between two other things that also go to zero. So all three of them have to go to zero together. So this is an example of an alternating, and not exactly alternating, but oscillating sequence that does converge because it goes to zero. To show that on a graph, if you're oscillating, but on both sides getting closer and closer to zero, that's okay because eventually you can actually say you're getting closer and closer to the same number versus in the other case where you were jumping back and forth between negative one half and positive one half. Okay, I think that is enough to throw at you um, today. Um, most of this was probably review for some of you. Um, maybe some... Um, remembering some techniques for others. Um, we will be using these limits or just finding limits in general to help us analyze series. Okay, so um, 
For some of you, this particular uh, section won't be that bad because you remember all your limit rules. For some of you, it will hopefully get you up to speed for when in the next section we start actually looking uh, at our you know first step at finding um, whether or not series converge. Okay, so I will talk to you all in that one. Cheers.